Hello, Internet. Welcome to Legacy Conversations. And I must tell you, I think we've got something very special lined up for you. There's going to be three episodes. And these episodes deal with what special forces themselves consider to be the best operation they've ever done. And that is Operation Amazon. It was an attack on Lupitu Harbor, where three different targets were hit on the 10th of August, 1980. And before such an attack can take place, reconnaissance must be done. And in this case, there were two reconnaissance operations. That would be Ops Artist and Ops Ginger. In this, the first of the episodes of three in the series, we look at Ops Artist and Ops Ginger. That is the reconnaissance phase. And we have everybody here. We have the operators, we have uh, even the submarine commander, now a retired Rear Admiral Steve de Toy. And let me thank Lieutenant Colonel Franz van Dijk. He was a warrant officer during the attack, a team leader. He actually took his team into the deepest part of the harbor. And uh, he's the man who came to me with the idea of Amazon. And making a series of it, as well as helping us with writing the, the script. He also got everyone together. We wish to thank uh, Colonel Franz van Dijk. And then we should not forget about the editing, which is uh, a lot of work in the background. And that was done by our very own Fossey Foster, a former flight engineer on the Allos, on the Allo Ed 3, at 16 Squadron, based in Port Elizabeth. I wish to thank both of these gentlemen for the time we've put in here. But now, let us carry on. Let us have a look at what happened during this uh, reconnaissance phase. To understand the operation Artist and Ginger, it is necessary that we orientate you on the map of Africa. On the left, you can see uh, direction north, as indicated there by the arrow. Then we have Angola, which is located on the South Atlantic Ocean, as indicated there. North of Angola, we have the Republic, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, as indicated over there. Then south of the, the Congo, we have Zambia, indicated there. And south of Zambia, we find Botswana, as indicated there. Then south of Botswana, we found South Africa, which is located on the most southern tip of Africa. Northwest of South Africa, we found Namibia, which is also located on the South Atlantic Ocean. And then north of Namibia, we found Angola, as indicated there, with the capital city, as indicated there, Luanda. South of Luanda, we have Lobito and Lobito Harbor. Of importance for, to you is the distance from the four reconnaissance Commando operational base located at uh, Langebaan, as indicated over there. The distance from this base to Lobito is two and a half thousand kilometers. During 1977-1978, two officers of uh, one reconnaissance Commander were tasked to do a target study of the FAPLA and the SWAPO logistic supply lines in southeast Angola. The aim of this study is to determine how can we disrupt these supply lines. During the study, seven, uh, several strategic targets were identified. Then it was sent to the Chief Staff of Intelligence for their input. And they also added two more 
strategic targets. In the years to follow, the Rekis raided and destroyed most of these targets. The map that you can see now is the harbor area of the Lubito Harbor. North is indicated by the arrow there. Then south of that, we found Lubito Harbor as indicated there, quite a big harbor. Then target number three, as indicated over there, that is the cement factory. South of target number three, we have target number two, which is a smaller fuel storage depot. And then right in the deep end of the, of the harbor, we found target number one, which is the main storage, fuel storage facility. South of that, we found the city of Lobito. And then the, the South Atlantic Ocean as indicated over there. On the point of the peninsula, there's a Russian and Cuban artillery base uh, situated there. This base is to protect the harbor against uh, possible air strikes. So they deployed uh, anti-aircraft cannons uh, on that point in that base over there. During 1979, teams of one and five reconnaissance commandos sabotaged the Humbia train tunnel between Lubongo and Mosamides. Mosamides is a harbor city uh, on the west coast of Angola. And so, uh, a bridge and some culverts in the Leba Mountain Pass, which is also a road between Lubongo and Musamaris uh, on the west coast. Port Musamaris was now effectively isolated due to these actions. With the result that Port Lobito became very important for the stockpiling, fuel and ammunition. The South African Navy that a submarine reconnaissance, uh, in, a close inshore reconnaissance of the Lobito coastline, the shipping activities in that area, and they took some peris periscope photos of the shoreline. This was followed up with a harbor reconnaissance by four reconnaissance commando. This recce team was launched from the submarine in a rubber boat and they infiltrated the harbor and they took some photos from the rubber boat of the possible targets uh, in that harbor. After this reconnaissance by four reconnaissance regiment, it was deemed necessary that a landward reconnaissance had to take place uh, to confirm the EEIs. EEIs means the essential elements of information and to gather other intelligence concerning the targets, the harbor area, and the activities in and around the harbor area. A specialist reconnaissance team from one reconnaissance commando was tasked to conduct this landward operation of the Lobito targets. Operation Ginger is the follow-up operation following Operation Artist. In other words, this is now the landward reconnaissance of the various targets. I need to orientate you on the harbor area so that you understand what the reconnaissance team leader is going to talk about later on in the program. North, as indicated there by the arrow, then we have the Lobito Harbor, as indicated there. It's quite a big harbor. Then we have the cement factory, indicated there. That is also known as target number three. South of the cement factory, we have the secondary fuel depot. That is a smaller fuel depot, 
as indicated there. And then we have the main fuel depot in the deepest part of the harbor as indicated there. And then Libito City to the southern part of the harbor area as indicated there. Mission. A reconnaissance team of one recce, supported by a boat team of four recce, must do a reconnaissance of the Libito Harbour, the main fuel depot, the secondary fuel depot and the cement factory between 9 to 11 June 1980. The team must be inserted and extracted by submarine. Guidelines. The seaborne capabilities of the Special Forces and the SA Navy must not be compromised. Combat equipment and uniforms must not be traceable to South African forces or South Africa. Restrictions. The submarine must return to South African waters not later than midnight, 14 June 1980, with or without the reconnaissance and boat teams. Force Composition Special Forces Operation Commander Major Bert Saxa 2IC 4 Recce Intelligence Officer Lieutenant Navy Peter Sutcliffe 4 Recce SA Navy Team Leader Reconnaissance Team Staff Sergeant Jack Krief 1 Recce Team Leader Boat Team, Lieutenant Tuffy Yobe, 4 Recce. SA Navy, Submarine SAS Maria van Riebeek, S97. Commander, Commander Steve de Toy, 7 Medical Battalion, Medical Doctor, Times 1. Yeah, I was called in to the unit on a Saturday morning by the officer commanding and he told me to prepare a team to go to Langebaan to do a reconnaissance of a target uh, and I must select, select another two guys. I decided to take Sam Furry with me, he was a, my buddy at that stage and we have done a, a number of operations together. And then I also decided to take Alphonse. He also have done uh, training with us. So he was a qualified reconnaissance um, team member. We decided to take him with, to use him in a, in a sort of pseudo role if, if we have to. Uh, we flew down to Langeban in uh, Dakota, landed there, was received by the four recce guys. West, west off to uh, Langerbahn to, the, to their base and issued with Navy uniform. And uh, we started with the planning for the reconnaissance operation uh, in Langerbahn. Now, <clears throat> the counterintelligence guys was very concerned that we will be captured. Now, this was the first operation where a, a, a reconnaissance team was landed on the ground and will stay over for a couple of days. The previous operation on the Tanzanian coast was uh, quick in and out. This one was a lot, lot more riskier and uh, uh, the, 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 the powers to be was really concerned that we are going to be captured and, and it's going to compromise the South African presence in the area. So the counterintelligence guy came up, came up with some ridiculous cover story that we, we will be uh, not, we will, uh, we will be uh, yacht uh, crewmen, crew members from a yacht. And this yacht would be knocked over by a well and sank off the coast of Angola. And we will be washed out on the Lobito coastline where we will now report and hand ourselves in or be captured there. Now, initially, because we, we weren't sure what, what's happening, we thought, okay, let's stick to this uh, story. But I also informed these guys that, look, we've got a couple of uh, 
problems here. The first one is that neither of us three has been on a, on a yacht ever. Uh, one of us cannot swim, and the other two are used to farm dams in the free state. That's where we, the water surface that we've operated on. So you've got a problem here. They reckon, no, it's not a problem. We're going to do an orientation with you on the Compass Roads, which is the yacht that uh, Fort Recce had there, which they did training on. And uh, they reckon that when they finish with us, we will know enough to be able to uh, bullshit our way out of, out of uh, a capture situation. Okay, so that led to some training on the yacht uh, and also a planned trip around, I think it was around Cape Point. I'm still, still not sure where we've uh, uh, sailed with that thing uh, of a trip. I think it was a two-day trip from Langebaan to meet up with the submarine in Simonstown. Uh, that turned out to be a nightmare trip and uh, uh, it's a story on, by itself, but uh, the guys were sick, very, very sick. And uh, it took us a couple, uh, it took us more than a week just to recover from that trip. Uh, luckily, we had two very experienced sailors on board. It was Warren Bruin and uh, Jelly Duplessis, who, who, uh, who, who uh, uh, what's the word, Coxwin, the Coxwins of the yacht, and uh, they took us through the storm. Uh, the, the Sam and, and, and uh, Alfonso was down, man down, after about an hour of, of sea. And uh, uh, we had a very, very violent storm that blew up and kept us busy for uh, the whole night and the next day. And I think the whole night as well, the next night as well. Uh, according to them, it was the worst that they've ever been in. I thought, I thought it's the end of my, uh, my life. I've seen my life passed me uh, and that also convinced me to never never get on a yacht again uh, so uh, luckily the guys came to their senses and realized that this story is not going to work this cover story is not going to work so we uh, we assumed and we uh, gave ourselves uh, east german uh, identities we got east uh, Angolan ID identification cards with East German identities, myself and Sam, and then uh, uh, Alphonse then took up uh, Angolan citizenship again. And uh, we stuck to that story. And the aim of that was just to, to sort of bullshit our way through uh, stops by troops or locals or police uh, by telling them that, look, we are uh, East Germans and we are on some other business trip. And, and uh, Alfonso was our guide. And, uh, and then we also had a lot of cash uh, hidden in our clothing and, and, and wherever we could find a hole. We have hidden cash to, to bribe our, ourselves out of these sort of situations. My name is Steve Detroit. In 1980, I was the officer commanding of the submarine Maria van Riebeek, one of three Daphne submarines of the South African Navy. Now, in, in the maritime world, the submarine is known as a force multiplier. The reason being, it's difficult to detect and you require surface ships with specialized sonar equipment to, to combat the submarine or to keep it away from soft targets like uh, aircraft carriers or large uh, cargo vessels bringing supplies to a uh, country. Uh, to illustrate the point, in 1966, the United Nations Security Council uh, did a study on how many ships, warships and support vessels will be needed to blockade all South Africa's major ports. Uh, the answer was 72 vessels will be needed, but it read, should South Africa possess one operational submarine, the number of vessels required will, be will have to be multiplied by three. That gives you an impression of the value of a submarine for a country. 
So no wonder a year later in 1967, the South African government signed a contract with the French government to obtain three Daphne submarines. Uh, they are relatively small submarines, 1,000 tons dive, 53 meters in length, um, carries a crew of 44 and also then six officers with about 10 spare makeshift uh, bunks available for men under training or should you carry special forces uh, or uh, test personnel. Um, because of the small size, the submarine is ideally suited uh, for uh, shallow water operations, which is obviously what you do if you operate with uh, special forces. A bit more information about the Daphne submarines. It has, they have um, several sensors, sensors. They have two periscopes. One is called the search periscope. The thickness of the periscope is about the size of a man's upper thigh. And the attack periscope, the last, the top length, top meter is about the size of uh, the thickness of a man's forearm. Uh, the attack periscope is manned from a sitting position and the captain at the periscope with a lever can drive the periscope up and down to make sure that it is the smallest possible distance above the surface for uh, security reasons if you don't want it to be detected. At the same time, you can raise it high if you want to increase your vision. Both periscopes have a, a magnification setting, which uh, helps a lot to uh, bring your targets closer to your eye. The uh, submariners are all volunteers. You cannot force a submariner. You cannot force a, a sailor to serve in submarines. And when new, when we receive new applications, we send them to sea in a submarine for a few days to see whether they can become accustomed to the cramped environments and all the equipments and pipe and et cetera around them. The uh, other sensors that we have, we have sonar, active sonar, we have passive sonar, we have uh, on top of a mast, we have a radar intercept uh, mechanism, which is extremely important when you do special operations. We have active radar, which we never use because when you transmit, you uh, give away your position. Uh, we will only do that in, a, in a, uh, when we do passage uh, from one point to another on the surface, uh, and which is not classified as a special operation. The submarine can dive to 300 meters operationally. The crushing depth of the submarine is 450 meters. In those days, the early 60s, when the Daphnis came in, uh, in operation the first time, it was one of the deepest diving submarines in the world. Um, the, the meals for the submarines is a bit of a complicated affair because the galley, because of the small size of the submarine, the galley is extremely small. In fact, the chef has to leave the galley to open the lid to climb down into his uh, deep freeze. So to simplify matters, all the meals come on board in numbered boxes. A complete meal for the first day will, in, will be in box number one, et cetera, et cetera, up to box number 30 if you plan to stay at sea for a long time. Just a, a word on special operations from submarines. It's not a new thing. During the Second World War, the Royal Navy um, did several, um, or in fact, many, many special operations where they landed their commandos uh, on German territory or territories occupied by Germans to carry out raids and uh, just, uh, destroy uh, German weapons, etc. Uh, one famous one was when they uh, landed commandos on the island of Malta. And subsequently, subsequent to the war in 1954, a film was made called They Who Dare that depicted that specific operation. I was 10 years old. I saw the film. I was totally fascinated. I immediately built myself a model submarine. Unbeknown to me at that time, 26 years later, I would be involved in a similar operation.
the, the, the period in Langebaan was spent training, physical training, uh, contact drills, crossing obstacles, climbing over walls and, and, and up ladders and, and everything we could find that, that would possibly come in our way. And then planning. Uh, also radio procedures was, uh, was uh, practiced. The radio uh, Morse code and, and all the, the codes were, were, were practiced and, and worked out. Uh, we spent a lot of time planning our routes in the, in the event of, of a evasion situation where we were compromised and we had to escape the area and evade. Uh, it consisted of a series of rendezvous, rendezvous uh, positions quite clearly marked on a map, which we could memorize because we couldn't carry a map, uh, maps with us. Uh, we had to memorize the positions, and then a certain time uh, and a certain date, we would go to those outstanding positions, uh, landmarks, and then wait for the submarine to return to that area and launch the Zodiacs to pick us up. So that, in short, was the escape route northwards. We also... Uh, studied the maps. Luckily, the Portuguese are very good at navigation, as we know from the earliest of time. So they had very good maps. And the maps indicated pineapple fields and banana fields north of Lobito. And so we would have ate bananas and pineapples for a couple of days, possibly weeks, until we were picked up again by Duffy and his, and his men. Uh, after this epic yacht trip, which uh, uh, we sailed around Dassan Island, I think, about 10 times because during the night I had to, to take a number of bearings and the next day to Dassan Island. I thought, why don't we just drop the sails and, and, and start the engine and, and start sailing in a direct straight line to get to wherever we wanted to get to. But eventually we ended up in Simonstown and uh, had to meet the program, the training program with the uh, submarine. And so we uh, left the, the, the compass rows. Luckily, we didn't have to clean up the mess inside because it was, it was uh, uh, very dirty and, and the guys were sick inside and there was water and everything was in one pile of rubbish. So we uh, boarded the submarine and the training with the four recce guys and the submarine got used to the submarine. And uh, as Commander the Tway, uh, Admiral the Tway mentioned, it was very, very uh, compact inside. For a guy, for two guys that come out of the Free State, the I felt oh, those open plains, grass plains, you suddenly have to get into that confined space uh, was, was quite an experience. Uh, the, most of the training, the rehearsals was done at night. So all the all the uh, uh, debussing and and embussing and de uh, embarking, all that was done at night. Carting equipment uh, up in and out of the submarine, and just getting to know the the situation. Uh, working with the four decky guys were were very professional. And uh, the same can be said for the submarine guys. They, they, each one, each man in that submarine knew his duties. Each four-decky guy knew exactly what to do, when, and uh, it was it was quite an honor and uh, to work with these guys to see how professional they were in in carrying out their duties. During the month of May, we received a warning order that a special operation is to follow. That in human terms meant forget about buying radio ticket correction, rugby tickets, and also don't, can, don't plan any leaves. It's not going to happen. A uh, short while later, we received the full operations order for an Operation Ginger with a mission to transport Recce teams discreetly to or undetected to Lubito in order for them to do reconnaissance 
both um, seaward and ashore. That was our task. Now the operations order spells out in detail exactly when you are going to sail, when you're supposed to come back, if all went well, well, the do's and don'ts in terms of communication and also the security. Now I must mention that even the fact that uh, the submarines at that stage were already working with four recce's for a few a number of years already, and we were well exercised and we had uh, extremely refined standing operators procedures. Even that cooperation was kept secret from the rest of the Navy and the public. It was not discussed. And security was so tight that before any operation took place, the old ship's company had to sign documents relating to the official Secrets Act, Act to make sure that uh, you can be uh, uh, held uh, accountable for breach of security should it come out that you spoke about an operation or cooperation with the recce's, etc. In fact, it was so tight, it was run on what we call a need to know basis, which meant that the submarine crew, except for the captain, the first lieutenant, and the navigator had no idea when you sailed on a special operation, what the target area was, when you would be getting there, when you would be coming back, what the recce's were doing on board, what they did once they came back on board, which meant it was extremely uh, difficult for them to remain dedicated under those circumstances. But they did so without any complaints. Now, the operation order also uh, obviously kicked off intense planning on our side. Uh, you had to plan the route to be uh, as far as away from surface vessels as possible because it is meant to be a discrete transit. Now, with a discrete transit, what we mean by that is that you try and avoid detection at all costs. But at the same time, you cannot uh, do the whole passage dive, it's simply it'll take too long because the speed dive is too slow. So what you do, you transfer it on the surface during the day. If it's cloudy weather, we like that because that means the Russian spy satellites uh, cannot see you. If there's no cloud cover, you follow a zigzag course. So should they have a look at photographs and they try and link the presence of the submarine to something that happened at the target area. At least it doesn't, the submarine is not pointing in that direction. It's 10 degrees um, to the open sea or <laughs> the heading shows coming back to land, etc. It wastes time, but it is important for security. Should you, during daylight hours, sight a surface vessel, you, from the bridge, you first see the, the funnels and the, and the bridge. And before they can then see you, we dive and wait till they are past. And we check through the periscope that they can no longer see us. And then we come to the surface again and we proceed. If there's lots of traffic, we simply dive and we snort and continue on our route. At night, of course, no problem. We're on the surface and we run as fast as we can to make up for time lost during the day to avoid contacts. Now, as I mentioned, at this stage, we've already worked a lot with the Rekis. We were very refined, very professional in all everything we did. But with uh, Operation Ginger, for the first time, we were going to land Rekis to remain ashore for some time to do uh, inshore reconnaissance. Up to now, all the reconnaissance done by the Rekis was done from Zodiacs, from Seaward, and also by the submarine through the periscope. So the new members from one recce were going to do the landward recce uh, at Lubito, uh, joined the submarine, or they didn't join, they first just visited the submarine and we gave them an orientation tour to let them get over the shock <laughs> of being the first, of their first exposure to the cramped environment, etc. And also we did a few exercises with them and one recce in daylight in Falls Bay, just to orientate them a bit. 
Then they went back to Longabon. And on Friday, the 31st of May, we uh, left Simonstown with a crew very excited about the prospects of what lies ahead and fully confident in what they were going to do. And that evening, we linked up with uh, the four recce Zodiacs outside um, Saldana Bay. And over the course of the weekend, we conducted several daylight and nighttime exercises, um, landing or launching the Zodiacs. They then go and land the one recce team ashore, uh, practice their rendezvous procedures, pick them up again, et cetera, et cetera. We did that during the course of the weekend, except for Saturday afternoon when we were on the surface and we all gathered in the forward mess of the submarine to watch the second test of the box against the Lions, which ended up in a victory for the box 26-22. And that set the tone for the rest of the operation. Everybody was very confident and in high spirits. Um, on the Sunday afternoon, the Zodiacs left the submarine, went back to Donkerhut to do their final preparations, because after dark, we went and into Donkerhut and we loaded all the equipment and all the men that were going to go with us. We also disembarked an officer of uh, one recce who came on board during the weekend just to observe how things are done because it was new for one recce's operation from submarines. And so after dark, after all the equipment was landed, Jack Kreev stayed ashore. He was going to join us in Wallfish Bay and he had to first brief his superiors about um, uh, their side of the operation and uh, what, what he thought of the exercises they did with the submarine up to then. So we left Donkerkat the Friday, correction, the Sunday evening to start our passage north to Lubito, 1,500 sea miles away. I received the warning order from my officer commanding and in the presence of the intelligence officer and the RSM. The security of the operation was as always top secret. And we received a, a basic harbor orientation of the area, which in this case was Libitu Harbor. The Maritime Navy has a lot of documentation on the on charts and books of tide and high tide and low tide and the the wind in the area and on many of these things you can find in books which the maritime navy uses to pick up of the harbor. But once you have received all these uh, pieces of intelligence and you start working on your on your operation and the planning, you start to get I, IEE, essential information that you need. And then you give your list back to the IO and then he does research in your time while you're doing other exercises. Usually during this warning order, you get the choice of operators that are available. And we must take into consideration that in those years, the unit wasn't very big and we only had about 15 operators to choose from. And then there are courses and promotion courses and other things happening. And you have only a certain amount of operators available. And usually the officer commanding gave you your team that you would have uh, for the operation. And of course, always there were reserves, one or two guys extra uh, in during the training so that they knew what was going on and they could always just slot in if need be. Because normal things do happen to guys, injuries and sicknesses and that type of thing uh, during the preparation and, and, the, and, and the operation. And even on way to the operation, guys can get ill on board the submarine and they have to change guys out. The boats that were used during this, um, this operation, once again, the amount of uh, equipment available in those years, we are talking about early 80s, 
there was limited equi equipment. What we used in those years was a Mark II Zodiac with 40 horsepower outboard engines and a 20 horsepower engine as reserve. One reserve engine per two boats. These reserve uh, engines or standby engines went with even on the submarine. They had to go with. Because if you picked up a, a, a problem with an engine, you have to exchange it immediately. Another important thing is that the hulls were stored on the outside of the submarine with the flexible fuel tanks. Now, if the boats, if the rubber ducks, uh, air intakes weren't closed and a guy forgot to close them, it would take water and then you've got a much slower boat than what you originally were planning on. And fuel tanks, you had to take extra fuel tanks because with the diving and the sea in the outside hatches, it, it's open, it's not open to the sea, but water flows through the hatches. And you can get chasing of the fuel tanks and you get loss of fuel. And the logic thing is that fuel tanks are not inside the submarine because of the fire hazard. So even the engines have to be run dry on the before the engines get put back into the into the uh, submarine. The engines were lowered down the forward hatch or taken out through the forehead hatch and you always got the biggest Navy guy in the vicinity to help with the rope to pull the engines up through the hatch and it only just fitted through the hatch. You only had about a hundred millimeter uh, play between the, the side of the hatch and the engine. The all the other equipment, as I mentioned, all the other equipment besides the holes and the fuel tanks were stored outside. The rest of the equipment was stored inside in the front of the submarine, there where you got what they call the rainforest on top of the torpedo tube. You used to store the equipment and below the hatchet. And this was a bit difficult because you can't just take out all the equipment and make sure you have to, you, you, when you start preparing the equipment, you can only take out pieces at a time because everybody is there. Even the, the sailors are there sleeping and, and you've got to be quiet and you can't make a noise. It, it, yeah, it was a complicated, uh, a complicated story. The width of the, of the hull of the deck of the submarine is only about one and a half meters. If the boat lies directly on top of the on top of the um, the deck, then you can't walk past it. So the, the boat has to lie at an angle on top of the deck so that you can walk past it and try and assemble it and get all the equipment into it. And then you've got to launch it. The painters have to be longer, longer on the boats as that boat then has to be held in position so that the guys can get on board in the sea. You can't load, the, push the boat into the sea fully loaded. You have to load the stuff while the boat is long, a long time. Yeah, that constituted the preparations. Uh, after that, the uh, 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 two team members boarded the submarine. Uh, after the completion of the preparation and uh, they left with the submarine for Balfour's Bay. I went back to Pretoria to brief the generals and say that basically we are ready. Uh, and uh, from Pretoria, they flew me up by the, with the Dakota to Roykop Air Base. And I spent a night or two in Balfour's Bay in a house, a safe house of some sort. General Liebenberg joined, joined me there and he started, he went fishing. Uh, he loved his fishing, so he went fishing for a while and then we waited for the submarine to join, join up uh, with us. During a discreet transfer towards Libito, 
we encountered uh, several surface vessels, but with the normal procedures, we managed to evade detection with all of them. And we, seven days after leaving Donkagat, we arrived at Lubito uh, region or area on a Sunday. Um, and we decided to, first thing we will do is to do a night periscope recce of the spit of land that obscures the harbor from the sea. The aim of that was to give the reckeys the opportunity to look through the periscope and identify the spit at night, various landmarks, lights, etc., because that's what they will be seeing once they approach the harbor in the zodiacs. Um, we spent the rest of the day uh, quietly relaxing and preparing ourselves for the first um, periscope recce that night. And here I might, I might just mention that uh, the fact that submarines are involved in landing special forces um, at uh, or on the Angolan coast was considered to be a top secret um, fact. The reason being that should it become known that submarines are involved, it'll be very easy for the Angolans or the Russians or the Cubans to take the necessary protective measures to counter the submarine and the landing operations. And the submarine in shallow waters is a sitting duck. You cannot dive to escape detection. You cannot protect yourself or defend yourself once you're on the surface. Uh, you're extremely vulnerable with uh, gun, uh, any gunfire piercing your ballast tanks, etc. So that fact, uh, the involvement of submarines uh, must be kept uh, a secret at all times, highly classified. And that's also spelled out in the ops order that especially once the recce team has been recovered from a shore reconnaissance, uh, the presence of a submarine in enemy waters must be kept uh, secret, uh, and that must be considered a top priority above everything else for the reasons I mentioned, because it will compromise all further operations. Now, should it happen that uh, you cannot recover your operators, there are various um, alternatives worked out beforehand, decided between the submarine and the operators. For instance, if you cannot pick them up as planned and you have to come back later, that is carefully worked out times and additional or alternate pickup places where you can rec recover the wreckies. But this normally can go on for a maximum of about two days, because at this stage now, uh, the submarine might be running out of um, spares or fuel or, um, or food. And also you have the uh, problem that should you lose communication with the wreckies, you are not sure whether they have been caught, tortured, and whether the, your presence there has been compromised. And also whether the future or the next planned rendezvous was perhaps compromised due to interrogation, uh, torture, etc. So the Rekis always had, they will know this better than I do, or they can explain it better, but their final plan was if the last shore pickup rendezvous failed, then the escape plan was inland, and then they had to make, make their way back inland by means that only they know how best. But anyway, uh, seven days after leaving Donkerhat, we arrived at Lubito and it was decided that the, um, after the first periscope recce, the next day we relaxed, everybody prepared all the equipment and uh, freshened up and got a good rest before the night uh, drop that was planned for midnight, roughly midnight. Uh, two days before arriving at Libito, uh, myself and the team leaders discussed possible drop-off points, possible uh, 
pick up points. Sorry, now this is the rendezvous points for the for the zodiacs. Uh, the beach pickup points uh, that is only decided between the zodiacs and the one recce team going ashore. That has nothing to do with the submarine. The submarine only uh, is involved with a pickup point or rendezvous point to pick up the the zodiacs. Um, normally, what we do, we plan or we decide on three, at least three um, rendezvous points for the zodiacs because. You don't know how many contacts will be in that area uh, on that specific time. So you must prepare to shift your rendezvous to a place where there are less contacts that can uh, become aware of your presence. Yeah, we were now on our way in the submarine, on our way to the target. Life in the submarine was uh, very confined. Very boring. There was a, it was moist, and then there was a very familiar smell that st stuck to me for uh, some time after the the trip. I still could smell that uh, almost like a, the old trains that we used to travel from uh, Ladysmith to Oatsuren when we went there for course. Those old steam trains. Um, while on, on our way to the target, we uh, spend our time reading and lying. And in the radio, uh, Sam uh, uh, linked up with the radio operator. And we made sure that he is uh, familiar with our codes. And the Morse, uh, Morse key or the Morse code uh, uh, communication, which we will be using. We did not use mo uh, voice, voice communication. We used Morse all the time. Uh, the food was very good, like uh, Tuffy has mentioned. That was out of the out of this world. It was uh, we actually picked up weight while lying there, uh, eating eating the nice food, especially the bread, the fre fresh baked bread. At some other stage, we were running into the target, and uh, Admiral Petway called us called me forward, and we had a. I looked through the periscope to orientate ourselves. We could see the target. Um, I must not forget the bubble gum, the sugar-free bubble gum and the biltong that was issued every morning. We were woken up if we were sleeping, shaken up, shaken awake by the, by the crew member and then given a packet of bubble gum and biltong. So we became like professional bubblegum chewers after the time that we spent there. So that um, that uh, evening, we started our countdown, which is a normal procedure uh, for L hour, launch hour. With the countdown at certain time, certain actions must be completed. The Reckeys in the forward mess are preparing all the equipment. Uh, the submarine makes sure that all their systems are ready. There's lots of excitement on board. And everything is tense, but confident. Everybody is confident. And on the run in, we are obviously at action stations during these operations. Um, there is no noise, unnecessary talk. Uh, the only uh, speech in the ops room is, in fact, the reports coming from the sonar sensors and the radar interceptor. And the reports that reached me at the attack, attack periscope, and then my orders to the armsmen and the control center are what to do in terms of changing depth, changing course, etc., and uh, reporting and plotting contacts on the plot. Uh, where I'll sit at the periscope, I can look down at the plot, and all the contacts that are plotted, I can see on the plotting table next to me. Now, the, the aim of these uh, recce's before we actually do a drop is to identify all the uh, prominent landmarks so we can plot them on a paper plot, which we then use for navigation when we come in to do uh, the landing. Anyway, we crept in, avoiding contacts. There were several trawlers uh, operating in the area, also some big trawlers uh, at anchor. 
luckily not too close to the first drop-off point planned. But what was worrying is that the fact that uh, there was lots of fluorescence in the water, and I suspected that we were disturbing the water and leaving a trail with the attack periscope up and also the, the radar intercept mast. The radar intercept mast is very important because you listen for any radar intercepts. And if you get an intercept, the uh, plot table directs me in that direction. And if I see a vessel and there's a, a radar transmission, I'm quite happy because I know the vessel is there. But if we get a radar, in, of course, sorry, if I look in that direction, I see a vessel with uh, the navigation lights or deck lights of a vessel. Um, I'm confident uh, we know where he is and we can put him on the plot. But if we get a radar intercept and I look on that bearing and I do not see a contact, that becomes a worrying factor because that means it's a vessel um, that's darkened and you are darkened for a specific purpose. And if that vessel is moving around, that means it is a vessel patrolling without lights, possibly to try and surprise a submarine. Also our sonar pick up screw noise and they also direct me in that direction. And then the same result as with the, um, with the uh, radar intercepts. If I see a vessel, a lit vessel, then I'm quite uh, satisfied and I uh, feel comfortable. But if I don't see any lights and we do pick up the screws in that direction, the same thing again, that becomes a worrying factor. Anyway, we dropped the, we reached the uh, drop off point and uh, we surfaced. And within 20 minutes, the Zodiacs were on their way uh, into the harbor to look for a drop of uh, a, a suitable drop point to leave the one uh, recce team ashore, the three members of the one recce team. I just touched on the subject in my previous uh, recording, and that was preparation before the operation inside the submarine is very, very difficult and it's complex. Uh, stuff of stored below the deck board, that's inside below the table. Now it's lunchtime. Now you have to pack everything away because people want to eat. And then you come out and you just start carrying on with your stuff and then it is tea time. And we don't, we don't always remember that normal tea time outside here is easy. But in a submarine, it's not that easy. So the tea gets brought inside, the table has to be assembled, and you have your tea and snacks, and it makes it quite difficult. But we learned to live with it, and we prepared all the equipment and made sure that everything was everything went through again. Even your your patching kit that you had, emergency patch kit that you had to repair the rubber duck, was checked that the glue was still good, that the patch was there. The engines were checked again, that nothing had broken off while storing. And your own personal equipment had to be gone through again and back to functioning. Then about one hour before launch hour, the countdown was given and then you started final preparation. Now, usually we ate before that time for the the sailors wait until we left and then they had their supper. But usually, once we started packing out, everything was packed out that had to go through the hatch first until the last things were packed out on the table. And as the boats were assembled, the next thing was the engine, then the engine would come up. And then uh, after that, the safety equipment would come up and then the guy's personal kit would come up. And then when everything was up, the, 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 the visitors or the, the guys who were going to be dropped off came up through the hatch and then the boat would have been launched already and the guys would then get on board. Arriving on top of the deck, you would immediately get the hull out of the side casing. It's a hatch that you open and you pull the hull out and you started opening the hull. Then the floorboards would come out and you would assemble 
the boat on top of the deck. Then the engine would come up and it would be put on the back of the transom and there was a safety cable from the engine to the transom in case the, it broke off. You didn't lose the engine. And then the equipment was packed in, the boat was launched and the guys, uh, the, in this case, Jack and the recce team uh, came on board and they were loaded on board and the two boats drifted off. Uh, the launching, the, uh, the, the night that we launched, uh, is quite an experience. I mean, we were just standing there like uh, rookies and watching the whole uh, show happening in front of us. The four recce guys scrambling, the, 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 the submarine crew scrambling to get everything up in record time. We were just standing there like blind people. And then at some other stage, we were grabbed and said, okay, it's now your beard, get up. We moved up and we were basically guided on the, on the deck of the submarine, guided by somebody holding onto you and then pushing you from left to right in the right direction uh, until we eventually ended up in the Zodiac. Um, and then uh, the trip towards the target. We dived, left the area, and we were going to come back in four and a half hours later to do, uh, recover the Zodiacs. Uh, that went according to plan. We left. Once we were about away from the submarine, the two boats came together and made sure everything was intact. Jack had all his equipment. The two guys with him had all the equipment and all our equipment was ready to go. The submarine would then turn around and depart and dive and we would then um, start proceeding to the harbor. Usually, it would be on a light or a compass daily. And it will be, initially it will be quite fast. And then once you're nearing the harbor, you will slow down unbelievably in speed because you have to be very careful and you have a weight. And in that part of the world, you have fluorescence in the water which is very, very visible. If you drive too fast, the, the, the engine, the outboard engine picks up a hell of a lot of fluorescence. And it's a clear line of where you were, were moving. When we neared the harbor, we had uh, small fishing boats that guys were fishing. Luckily, they had lanterns inside the boat with them on board, either to attract the fish or that they could see what they were doing. But this helped us a lot because if they looked out to see or looked to a side, they couldn't see you because their eyes were used to the lantern and they couldn't adjust that quickly. The initial, uh, into the harbor, the initial uh, course was very easy and the, the, the drop off position that Jack identified was quite a remote beach. And we could, the whole time we could look with night sight and binoculars. In those years, the night vision was not so good. And we found that the binoculars was better. You just had to concentrate more and check more with it. But very often you use your binoculars or, and then again, your normal eyesight, if you are used to picking up things, it was quite easy to pick up something. The beach was very clear, and we dropped off Jack, and we returned back to the submarine. The, the orientation, uh, briefly, if you enter the harbor, on your right-hand uh, uh, right side, you have that peninsula. On the tip of that peninsula, uh, peninsula there was a an artillery uh, base and some artillery pieces. Then you, as you uh, enter the harbor and you continue on your left is a high ground. And the first uh, important place there is the drop off point, which is indicated on the map. Uh, luckily not far from the, orient from the drop off point uh, on the high ground is the bush that we identified, the, lying up place, uh, which is also marked. 
And then that is very close to the cement factory, which is uh, identified by the uh, chimneys, which is the third target, the third priority target. Uh, about 300 meters past the cement factory is the smaller target, the one that was later was allocated to me. Uh, it's built on a recovered, reclaimed uh, area in the harbor. And then on the opposite side of the harbor, on the right hand side, is the primary target, uh, the big, the big uh, uh, storage area. And on the photo, you can also see the sand bank, which will come into the uh, story later on during Amazon. Um, Tuffy or the, the boat crew was, as I said, very professional. There was the big problem with the fishing, uh, the fishing boats. Uh, they had lights, they had lit little lamps that was burning in the, in the deck uh, of the boat and that hopefully blinded, I think blinded the, 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 the fishermen themselves. Gave us a good uh, indication of where they were so we could negotiate around them. At the landing point, uh, we stopped away some time, uh, some distance off the, uh, the, the, the coast and then uh, observed the landing point, made sure there was no stragglers or fishermen hanging around there, moved in. The, as the boat scraped, the Zodiac scraped the ground, we got off, turned it around and waved. I think Crick was the one coxswain. Uh, Crick Creer, we waved him off and off they went. and. Uh, back towards the sub. At about seven kilometers from the shore, we threw a M26 grenade into the water. This sound was picked up by the submarine and they could get the, the general direction where we were, where, where we were. Initially, we were always in the right position. Uh, and that is said with a tongue in, in, the, in the cheek because there are, you can make mistakes. But it's like the Air Force always also threw us on the right DZ. But I don't know if it was always the right DZ. The same with the Navy. If you left the harbor and you went to the RV with a submarine or the strike craft, you would, um, you were always in the right position. It came back. Four and a half hours later, um, the rendezvous procedure, procedure with the Zodiacs uh, is basically the following. They get into the area uh, which they established with taking bearings or by taking bearings from the landmarks that they have identified uh, previously during the periscope recce. And if they're more or less in the area, they drop a pinger overboard or they hang a pinger overboard uh, that transmits a very weak uh, sonar signal, but we can pick it up uh, up to a range of uh, 1,500 meters. It gives us a bearing to steer on. And we steer, dive onto that bearing until we see them through the periscope and then we surface close to them and um, embark them. If we cannot embark them because the other contacts are too close, uh, we simply indicate to them that uh, we are remaining dived and they must follow the periscope. And then we steam, leave the area and they follow the periscope. That in fact happened uh, the following evening when we did uh, Zodiac only reconnaissance. But this first pickup went fine. There was no trouble. The contacts were quite far away. Uh, we embarked uh, the, uh, the two recce teams, got the Zodiacs on board, and we started leaving the rendezvous area while we were disassembling the, the Zodiacs on the quay. Then, <coughs> excuse me, after that, we would drop the sonar boy, the finger, into the water. <coughs> The submarine could pick that up at about between one and 1,500 meters and then zoom in on it and they came up within meters of the, of the rubber duck. In, and then reverse action 
everything gets disassembled and put back into the boat. The engines have to be run dry because we cannot allow fuel into uh, the submarine. So there we were, standard, standing on Angolan soil in Lobito Harbor. And we wait a while, waited a while until the, we were sure that the, the, the two Zodiacs were, were back at the, at the submarine uh, before we started our tour inland, just in case something happened and we had to be picked up again. So we waited there for a while and then made our way inland towards our tree, looked around for a while and then saw the tree or the bush that we thought was a bush, but it wasn't really a big bush. It was a, a fairly small uh, shrub where we moved in and settled down and tried to sleep for an hour or so, but it was impossible. Uh, first light came and suddenly, you know, there's a, a whole strange world around you. There were ships lying at anchor in the harbor. Some of them were obviously Russian. We heard some very loud Russian music. Uh, and uh, one felt quite lonely in that position and exposed, as that was the only bush. So everybody looking in our direction was looking at this bush. Uh, the, the first day also didn't start very well. Uh, we, it was just becoming light when the, uh, there was a, an old lady, old woman coming towards the bush to come and collect firewood. So I told Alphonse, I said to him, listen, just tell this woman that uh, she can't come here. There's a, there's a, where the army is busy with an exercise, just chase her away. So that worked. We watched her, obviously watched her very intensely and, and, and where, uh, where she was going. She spoke to some people, which was now at the landing point where we landed earlier the night. Uh, and, but they didn't look in our direction, so we were quite happy that she's happy with what she heard. Uh, at that stage, I was taking photographs, at the, uh, panoramic photographs at, the, at quite the right, just to get all the information on film. Uh, so in case we had to move it, we at least had some good information on, on the harbor and, and the area. As I turned the camera towards the, 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 the cement factory, there was a, a, a police vehicle and an army truck loaded with troops heading straight for us. It felt like they were inside the lens as they were very close. They turned up into the uh, cement factory and disappeared into the cement factory. Now, obviously, one, one, uh, all sorts of things goes, uh, you know, through your mind. Have we been compromised? Have we been seen? Have the women called somebody, uh, made an alarm, and so on? So we, we decided, look, it, it might be better to get to move to some other place a little bit further away. We were still busy <clears throat> uh, discussing the situation when we heard some shouting some distance away from us. Uh, and we looked in that direction with the binoculars and saw that there's a, an army parade ground with some troops on the parade ground and somebody sh drilling them, shouting commands. That was about, uh, if I can remember correctly, about 600 meters from, from our position. So it wasn't very far. Uh, we saw the barracks and then decided, no, it's, it's a bit dicey here where we were. Uh, we have to move just to a little bit safer position where we can make a break if we have to. Um, the other problem that reared its head was on the first schedule. Now, we had a very, very tight radio schedule with the submarine. The submarine could not surface for very long. So he basically put up its antenna and waited for our transmissions on a specific time. So we had, we had like a 10 minute scheduled time, five minutes, two to five minutes past the hour, a specific time uh, where the submarine will then be near the surface, put up the, and its antenna, and we will transmit in Morse uh, the message. We had a, what we call a short code which was a, a, a brief description of the situation and then uh, a few Morse codes, characters that were sent, like five Romeos, did, did, 
that I did, that I did five of uh, Romeo's would mean everything is fine, mission completed, you can collect us tonight, pick up tonight. Uh, and there was a, a number of those short messages which will be transmitted by using a specific Morse code, Echoes or Romeo's or November's or whatever. Our first skit was a disaster. The radio didn't tune. So we missed the skit. If I remember correctly, we missed it completely. The radio would not tune, so we had a problem. Uh, we opened the radio. Sam opened the radio with uh, and, and looked inside. We didn't really know what to look for, but we looked, uh, we opened the radio. Luckily, it was very, very hot, and the sun was very hot. So it looks like that helped. Uh, because uh, as we later learned, uh, there was a, a, the moist in the submarine if, uh, went, uh, obviously penetrated the radio and, and that damaged uh, the tuning and some other mechanisms or electronics in the, in the radio. By just opening the radio and fiddling with it in the sun, dried out the thing, and the next get it worked. <coughs> um, so the first they were spent lying up, looking at the targets. We could not see the, 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 the smaller target, my, uh, the, the, the smaller installation. We could very, have a, had a very good view of the, the, the big target and the cement factory from the one side. Um, we also moved, we also decided to move our position. Uh, we got up, like naturally just stood up and started walking, not crawling or ducking and diving. We just walked normally away to another position where there was less shrub, but, but a little bit out of the traffic. Later that day, there were some children walking past us close by, which they didn't see us. And uh, uh, it was a bit of a tense moment. Uh, the first night we left our kit, the excess kit at the hide. And we started working our way around the cement factory, very close to the, the base on the back of this factory, uh, the army base. We, we passed close by the army base. We had to, the terrain was just very difficult. So we had to pass between the base and the cement factory. Uh, and we took up a position above the smaller uh, tank farm, the small storage area, where, which would later become my target. <clears throat> that was about, I would, say, I would say, about 100 feet above them on a cliff, right above the gate. So we sat there and watched the whole proceedings in the, in the target. Uh, take, took very good photographs of the target. And I think the most important thing that came out of that reconnaissance was that while I was sitting there, and, and observing this target and the people walking past uh, chatting to the guards and what uh, uh, and while observing the guards I just got a, a like a wave uh, over me uh, a feeling that entered me and and I just got this feeling that we can do this job we can do this operation it's it, uh, it, like the vibrations coming out of the area uh, confirmed me, with me that we will be able to pull this off. I think that was probably the most important part of that operation because I, when I got back, I was asked, can we do it? I said, yeah, we sure, we definitely can. And I got that feeling that that night sitting above that target and watching the guards and uh, the, the proceedings around the target and the target itself, I, I knew that it's going to be a success. So after that night, Reiki, we, uh, we moved back to the target but we were running out of time. So we decided to pass through the cement factory to cut, uh, cut some, uh, uh, sp uh, some time. Uh, we nearly bumped into a, some troops there who was waiting at the trucks. There were some trucks lined up to collect cement. And the troops had khaki uniform on, which is normally the swapper uniform that swapper wear, uh, was wearing. Uh, the one, the one uh, uh, driver, I, I assume he was a driver or a guard, uh, we, we're not sure yet, but he was so close to me, below, right below me, we ended up on an on a embankment, and this guy was so close, 
that I could all, if I stretched out my hand, I would have touched it. There was a fence between me and him. And I was looking down on him. He was right below me and I could have actually touched his head. So we pulled back from there, back into the cement factory. And there was a, uh, a uh, some mud that was pumped out of the factory that was sliding in a gutter. And we ended up in that, and that was quite slippery. So we moved out of that, back into this factory again. That also gave us a good look into the factory. And we then realized that there's a lot of people working in the cement factory. It's running 24-7. So we would not be able to attack the factory itself. It is just too complex. Uh, what we did notice, or uh, yeah, let me just finish this. Uh, uh, passing through the factory that time of the morning, we realized it's going to be a difficult target. So we just made it back to the hide just in time before, uh, before first light. Uh, during our lying up, the two days that we lay up there, we saw uh, above the cement factory was a, a large storage tank and a tanker filling up on a regular basis. Like every hour, there was a tanker rocking up, pumping some liquid into the, into the tank, and that tank obviously fed into the factory. So we assumed that that tank must be a very important target for the factory. And that was also then identified as a, as a target that will be attacked and not the factory itself. So uh, the second day, uh, we, uh, we continued with our observation, gathered as much information, especially on a second target, on a, on a large target, the entry area, the harbor situation at the harbor there, where they uh, were planning to land uh, the, 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 the riding force at the main target. So we could observe that very well. We couldn't see our target, the smaller target, but we had very good photographs of the smaller target. Uh, on the second day, we again tried the radio, the same story. The radio again gave problems. We opened that in the sun, uh, left it in the sun for a while, closed it again, and uh, a miracle, the, the, the antenna tuned. The two lights came on and the antenna tuned. Uh, Sam managed to get off some uh, Romeos on the Morski, and we assumed that the uh, submarine got that message because it was on time. What we later learned from the radio operator is that he only got five, if I remember correctly, five of the 15 uh, Rogers that we have transmitted. He only got five when the radio cut out again, and that was it. But luckily, that five confirmed, that five characters of, of Romeo's confirmed that we finished operation, we require pickup that night. So at the prearranged time, we were at the pickup point waiting. We uh, secured the landing point. The one guy went left, one guy went right. I stayed in the middle with the, with the lights. During, during our operation, we we have the pick we have timings L minus three, L minus two, L minus one. <clears throat> and you usually at L minus one, which means one hour before launching time, the lights of the submarine are switched to red. That's inside the submarine so that your eyes can acclimatize to the darkness. And once you go out of the submarine, everything is done in, in, in darkness. And most nights we chose to do it at dark moon so that you are even less visible than any other. In a lot of cases, it wasn't possible and you used the different phases of the moon. But I would say 90% of the cases, it's dark moon. We use the dark moon phase to do the operation. Once we, had to, uh, once we had a nice two days rest on the submarine and preparing our equipment again, we started again to go in back into the harbor so that we had to go and pick up to recover uh, Jack and the team. Everything was done again as in all the previous 
uh, preparation and all the, the, the time that we worked together, we did exactly the same routine again. The equipment gets packed out, the boats, uh, the engine, the boat equipment and the personal equipment. And then once the hatch opens, all the equipment comes out and you assemble the boats again in exactly the same order as what we've done previously. Once again, we moved in on a compass bearing <coughs> until we got the light visible. And then we started in with a sneaky part of going past the fishing boats and moving in between the guys to pick up, to go and pick up Jack and the two. They had uh, infrared lights on the beach. And once we were in position, we gave a click on the radio. Jack switched on the infrared right light and we picked it up with a night vision. And we moved in to pick them up. Now, in the, the advantage of picking up a team, they can secure the beach for you and they can just bring you in. You load them up and you return back uh, to the submarine. It's much easier than going into a beach and you have to go and wrecky the beach and then bring in the boat. There was a fixed, a fixed uh, light, infrared, and then an infrared strobe, which we combined on, at the right time, at the specific time we switched it on. The boat crew came in on time. We actually saw them coming in and it was quite a nice sight. As the hull scraped the uh, sand, that's a very familiar sound, very, con, uh, 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 what's the word, uh, and easing sound. Turned the boats around, got in, greeted the crew briefly, and slowly we worked our way back to the submarine. The movement back to the submarine was very uneventful, and we the RV procedure worked the same as what we have already mentioned of the hand grenade and the and the finger that is used in the water. Once back on the submarine, it's maintenance and maintenance and maintenance again. And then packing away the equipment and resting and having a good meal. And that is it. Uh, we were quite happy that Everything went well. We got, we were convinced that we got very good photographs. Uh, the radio gave problems, but it worked when it had to work. But of mercy on our side, and uh, the overall, the Ricky went very well, and we were quite happy when we got back into the submarine uh, after the opera, after the reconnaissance. Uh, the RV with the submarine went very well. And we were quickly on board and relaxed. And obviously, uh, arriving inside the submarine, all the, the crew was uh, watching us with large eyes. And, you know, they wanted to know where we were and what we've done and what we're up to. And obviously, we couldn't speak. And uh, so it was a, quite an interesting situation. The feedback from the uh, One Record team, when they came on board, we had a, a quick debrief in my cabin. They were very, very happy with, uh, with their results. Um, and uh, they were looking forward to, to uh, uh, processing the photographs to see what the result was. But by and large, uh, Jack and his team, uh, they, they were very happy. They did, however, report that they cited or they suspected a sighting of a bear a maritime patrol aircraft, which is a Russian uh, anti-submarine aircraft. And that became a bit of a worrying factor for us. And they also suspected that they saw warship masts behind some uh, merchant vessels alongside in the harbor. And once we left the Libita area, we dived, uh, and we stayed deeper than 140 meters for that night to avoid possible detection by the bear aircraft uh, that uses um, 
the MAD system. MAD standing for Magnetic Anomaly Detector. And that can detect a submarine which is close to the surface because of the magnetic uh, anomaly. And uh, you never know if there was a compromise with the members ashore, which alerts them to a presence of a submarine, which uh, then initiates a submarine search. So we had to play safe. Following the successful recovery of the team that did the uh, shore reconnaissance, we had three more tasks to do in the Lubiti area. The one was to do a, um, a seaward reconnaissance of the area immediately south of the harbor with Zodiacs to investigate if there was perhaps another access point towards the, the biggest target, target, target in the harbor area. The second was to do a periscope recce of the area just to the north of the harbor entrance for the recce to decide if they stood only to be picked up uh, close to the harbor, if they can head further north and be picked up there. And then the third one was to do a final a photograph periscope run of the spit and photograph all the prominent points of the on the spit. Uh, the first um, recce done by the Zodiacs the first night went fine. There were also once again many uh, contacts to be avoided, uh, but the rendezvous went successful and they were recovered. Something, <clears throat> something I never mentioned earlier was that in approaching the, um, the area to do the drop-off, when apart from the numerous uh, cargo vessels and uh, fishing trawlers that we encountered, there were uh, many, many very small fishing boats. Now, the problem with these small fishing boats uh, was that uh, often they only had one person on board and uh, they had no lights. And every now and then, he would, uh, we would pick up a lantern to have a look at his lines, etc., and then he would drop the lantern. So we nicknamed, nicknamed them Fireflies because they were coming and going all the time. But that, of, of course, um, presented a, a, a big danger because uh, they were difficult to see. You could snag their lines or you could actually pass so close to them that they will see the periscope um, and the, and the, ra the uh, radar detection mast. In fact, uh, when the Zodiac teams came back, they explained to us that when we approached the rendezvous to recover the boats, they could actually hear the noise of the periscope and the, and the radar detector mast cutting through the water. And they also saw a very bright trail of fluorescence behind the submarine. So the fireflies, the so-called fireflies, was also a big, big danger every time we went close inshore. Anyway, the first task successfully done. We spent the night, the rest of the night, and dived and resting. The next morning, we did the periscope recce. Uh, for the uh, northern area. However, the wreckies decided there were not enough prominent points to navigate upon, and so the uh, pickup will not be, uh, a pickup will be too difficult to, uh, to arrange on those flat areas. And the last task was to do the photo wrecky. Uh, that was completed, and uh, leaving uh, um, once the periscope recce was and photograph session was completed, we left the uh, Lobito area and started a discrete transit uh, south 250 miles to um, Mosomides. <clears throat> this was a, another task that we had to do, and that was to do a periscope recce of the Mosomides harbor, a daylight one and also a nighttime one. <clears throat> We arrived there two days later, and uh, we were about to enter the harbor at periscope depth uh, to do a recce um, about lunchtime on the Sunday. And on the left-hand side of the harbor, there was quite high ground. And uh, through the attack periscope, I could see a man in a red T-shirt standing there leaning against a small white building, which could, have, could be his house or some storage area. 
the worrying factor was that uh, he was so clear to me that I could actually also see the dirty finger marks on the white paint of the building. And I had the impression that he was looking straight down onto the submarine. And uh, with the water being quite calm, uh, there was a big possibility that he could see the silhouette of the submarine in the water. Nevertheless, we carried on and we did a successful daylight recce of the um, vessels in the harbor, and photographed some prominent uh, aspects in the harbor. We came out, uh, spent the rest of the day dived. Later, after sunset, we entered again and we did a similar uh, recce uh, to identify the uh, points earlier identified and also shoot them up and mark them on a plot. We left the harbor and around about uh, 22, 30, we were about six miles outside the harbor entrance and we surfaced and um, all the smokers tried to get onto the bridge to have a quick smoke. And um, not all long afterwards, we the sonar reported that they were picking up sonar transmissions from the north. We dived, had a look through the periscope and we saw faint deck lights approaching from the direction of Lubita. This necessitated a quick uh, appreciation of the situation. Uh, there was the top priority to remain undetected. And then there was the, uh, the obvious task of a submarine, and that is to gain intelligence as much as you can. So it would have been important for us to be able to possibly identify a warship with sonar capability on that coast. However, the top priority was to remain undetected and we could not take that chance. So we dived deep, took the necessary avoiding action and then continued on our way south. We left the, uh, the area and Thursday the 19th, we were going to be at sold at Wolfish Bay. But before we got to Wolfish Bay, the, the day before, the Reckeys uh, made the offer to us that the ship's company can use their weapons uh, and fire away some of their uh, ammunition that they did not use. We gladly took up the, the offer. Uh, we surfaced and uh, put some two oil cans in the water and those submariners who uh, was interested came onto the upper deck, used the uh, various weapons and fired away merrily. I was the lucky one that was given the chance to fire an RPG. Uh, the only problem was that the Ricky <laughs> who assisted me uh, either deliberately or, um, uh, or maybe forgot, uh, did not warn me to wear ear defenders. So my ears rang for several hours afterwards. Also what I forgot to mention was that um, the day after we left um, Mosamides, we uh, surfaced and after dark, and we gave the ship's company uh, the opportunity to stretch their legs on the upper deck. Because at that stage, uh, many of them has never had a chance to come onto the bridge to breathe some fresh air, uh, which is normally that small bridge is hogged by the smokers. We can only accommodate about three to four smokers at a time on the bridge um, with the lookout and the officer of the watch. So the, uh, uh, the firing exercise was highly appreciated and, uh, and enjoyed by the, by the crew. And I, might, I must report that the, the oil cans did go down. Uh, when we arrived, got close to uh, Wolfish Bay, in order to remain discreet, we dived and we approached the rendezvous uh, area where we were going to rendezvous with the Namakuras to disembark the Rekis. Uh, we did so dived. And when we surfaced and when I climbed onto the bridge, I was slipping and sliding on a mass of fish entrails that was caught in the close, uh, the small enclosure of the bridge. We obviously surfaced in the droppings 
of a, a, a factory, a factory ship that uh, collects the the, uh, the catches of the, tra the trawlers. Anyway, the only way, way we could get rid of it, we dived again and we did some high speed uh, maneuvers. Uh, and when we surfaced again, all the entrails were washed uh, were washed off. We rendezvoused with Namakura, said our goodbyes to the Rekis, and I'm sure they were very glad to leave the confined space because earlier that morning already they made it quite clear that they were now quite hot full of being inside a submarine and they wanted out. Once we dropped them, we still had four days to go to for a trip to Simonstown. It was quite uneventful. We arrived at Simonstown um, Monday the 23rd, lunchtime, the correction 1400. And we were pleasantly surprised as we entered harbor, we were welcomed by the Navy band playing a welcome tune on the key. And also on the key were many uh, relatives waving and welcoming us. Um, I must say, looking back at the operation, I was extremely proud at that time of my crew for their professionalism and also for their extreme dedication to continue doing their job under that difficult circumstances and not knowing what they were doing and where they were. And I must also add that the ship's company and the all the submariners as a whole were at the highest respect and regard for the Rekis because we knew every time they left the submarine, they were putting their lives in danger while we were remaining uh, warm and comfortable on board the submarines. Anyway, that was the end of Operation Ginger, which was then followed up by more operations leading up to uh, resulting in, in uh, Ops Amazon. The trip back to Walfus Bay was very relaxed. Uh, we wanted to get out obviously as quick as possible but uh, I th uh there was a there was a a uh, concert was arranged and the the, the submarine crew uh, uh, gave us a quite a nice concert there uh, in the confined space which was also very interesting to look to watch uh, we were dropped off at Walfus Bay at night again whisked away by the intelligence officer or counterintelligence officer, probably the same guy that worked out the ridiculous cover story. So they had to make sure that nobody sees us and uh, uh, make deductions of the operation. Uh, we were put up at the safe house and we had a braai in the middle of the night, had some steaks and a few beers, which went down very well and we went in for a sleep. Next morning, very earlier, we flew by Dakota, if I remember correctly, uh, back to Pretoria. We did a debrief there to the general. And uh, as I said, the question was asked, can we do it? And that night, sitting above that target, I just knew we're going to pull this thing off. And I said to him, yeah, Neil's going to do it. We can do it. Uh, let's go for it. Uh, I must mention that uh, I think without the professional uh, way in which the submarine crew acted and the boat crew, this would not have been, uh, we would not have been able to, to, be, to be that successful. So everything went very well. And I must thank everybody now, many years later, uh, again, thank everybody for, for, what they, for their contribution there. Uh, which was the beginning of a very good operation, Amazon. And we can read all of this in your book as well, Jack. Yeah, book is still there, it's still alive. They can order it uh, on, uh, on Lulu, lulu.com, the overseas guys. Otherwise, in South Africa, they can just contact me. I'll, I'll uh, send one. Well, internet. I will remind you again that this is just the first episode of three. Uh, there's two hours coming. The next one will be where the training takes place of one recce 
and they training, training, working with the Navy, and then move out. And then the third episode will be where they are actually on the strike craft just outside the harbors, about five miles away at, at least. And they move in and they are now attempting to destroy their targets. That is the third episode. So don't miss out on them. And talking about that, there were several books uh, written on this subject uh, by the operators themselves. So if you want to read them, all the descriptions are in the link. You can just get all of these books, like fantastic books, and just read them. If you want to know a bit more about the subject, these are the books which I recommend to you. Well, Internet, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Fantastic people, fantastic story. But there is something else. There's something else happening as well right now, which is fantastic, and I need to bring to your attention. So if you can give me another eight minutes of your time to listen to a conversation between Admiral Adnay Suderland, as well as our very own Andrew Whitaker. It is about a submarine. It's the last of a Daphne class submarines, which is still existing and served in the South African Navy. It is a sister ship to the one which we heard in this video, which was used so effectively. And she was called at that stage Johanna von der Merwe. Today she is known as the Asagai, that's the Afrikaans word for Asagai, which is a stabbing spear from the Zulu nation. The admirals through the Naval Heritage Trust are trying to, to save this ship to make it available as a museum ship to all the citizens of South Africa. But to do that, as you can imagine, costs a lot of money. Now, Legacy has contributed as much as we could financially, and we're now asking all of you, listen to this video. If you feel you can contribute, any donation is welcome, and please do so. The bank details is at the end of the video, as well as in the description. If you have any problems, don't hesitate in contacting me. Good morning, Legacy viewers. Um, my guest today is retired Ad Admiral Arne Sutherland. Um, and we're going to try and help with their fundraising cause to get the Asagai submarine moved to its permanent place where it would become a museum. Uh, welcome, Ono. Great to meet you. Um, so maybe if you could just give us a bit of the, the history behind the, the sub and what you need. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can get some donations. But if there's a big sponsor out there, that would be, be even better. Thank you, Andrew. You've summed it up very well. The Asagai was one of our, our third Daphne class submarines, which we decommissioned in 2003, November 2003, and she was the last. And as South Africa had no preserved ships, or at that stage we had one which has now been destroyed as well, we decided we'd like to preserve her uh, as part of our maritime history. And a bunch of us got together, some still serving at the time, others retired, and we started working towards preserving her. We got permission from the Navy in 2005 uh, to actually preserve her at no cost to the Navy as part of the Naval Museum. The next step was, of course, to raise funds. And by 2008, we were, the only way of doing that was by taking guided tours of her during the Navy Festival. But we then looked at the possibility of opening up to the public on the outer side of the wall, people approaching by boats. And through the system, we ran her from 2000, December 2010 to August 2015. And over that period, we raised about 800,000, but we also used a lot of that money to do restoration to her. We took her out of the water for uh, a refit, basic refit in 2015. At that stage, the Navy was concerned about her deteriorating further, so she was put ashore. Recently, uh, things were not looking very good because she was in the way in the dockyard and the Navy offered her to us again. We actually asked if we could start again, and they agreed. And we therefore started fundraising. 
and to date we have basically received a fair amount of money but more importantly we've used our initial funding to prepare the site the navy very graciously gave us a beautiful position right next to parking area access to the public with buildings and we've now laid down the foundations for the boat. She will no longer be in the water. She will be above water, uh, above the ground, sorry, with two accesses cut into her. In addition to preparing the foundations, which is quite a bit of heavy groundwork because we're on a reclaimed land, Diamond Shipbuilding Company Cape Town very graciously offered to assist us with building the stands out of steel, as well as the lifting frames to get her there. And last Monday, we had a formal handover where Darman presented the boat with its amendments to it, modifications to it now, to, and the Chief of the Navy received it on behalf of the Navy because it remains a Navy exhibit, but being run by the Naval Heritage Trust. And all the funding has been raised by the Heritage Trust to do the actual restoration and the move. Currently, we, the only way to move her is to get heavy equipment from Gauteng, and the move is estimated to cost 1.7 million rand, which could be a bit less if we can link it to a move by any other company which pays for the movement of the equipment down here. Uh, there are three companies, and one of them comes down, we might be able to get it, but it still means we have to raise a minimum of 1.2 million to, to do the move. Once we've moved her, it makes it a lot easier because we can open up almost immediately because the interior of the boat is in perfect condition and we can carry out the return using income generated from visitors to the boat. So what we're actually looking for right now is uh, to build up our funds. We're currently sitting at enough to cover the difference, but we need, mainly we need a sponsor. And the idea of a sponsor which will cover the move of say a million, 1.2 million, which by the way, if you convert it to pounds is a lot less, which we're looking for sponsors all over the world anyway and they get the full advertising rights for the move. They can then use them for advertisements. And the moving of a 700 ton submarine is quite an achievement. In addition, the company gets uh, recognition rights uh, at the museum, the sponsorship board, etc. plus use of the boat for company entertainment and things like that. So it might not sound much, but the importance of this is it's not just preserving a submarine museum. We're preserving the Asagai Museum of Technology. The whole idea being we're going to have display areas showing the technology used on a submarine, which by the way, few th systems in the world have more systems on board. A submarine works in three dimensions like an aircraft, but she uses or a sonar and all sorts of other acoustics and things, which others don't do. So we want to show the youth, and I'm talking about the, the pre-teens, the importance of technology, importance of maths and science and we're going to concentrate on this as part of a career uh, advice system and getting kids interested in the sciences. So it's preserving history but uplifting the youth of South Africa in the educational field. No, that's, that's great and um, yeah so from Legacy's point of view obviously our appeal is for uh, any potential donors to, to assist but if there's a big sponsor out there, that would be fantastic. Um, we will post the bank details on the video and as part of the, the sort of description of the video as well. So, you know, please guys, let's help. Let's, let's preserve the legacy. We're the legacy channel or legacy uh, video, but I think it's a legacy of of the, the submarine factor of the, the Navy. Um, so, so if we can help, that would be great. It's all from families. And for a donation, we acknowledge every single donation and all will go onto our donors list, which will be on display there. But for substantial donations, and we've had a number of them, for 10,000 Rand, for example, you get your name put on a bunk. Uh, the submarine has hot bunking systems. So for every two bunks, we have three people and they all changed during their watches. Uh, for a little bit more, we can do the wardroom for 30,000 Rand, and even the captain's bunk has got a, a name on it already. So the other thing is those donors also have free access to the submarine for themselves and their families, and also make use of us for entertainment purposes, etc. after hours. Just, you can also mention that donations, uh, any, any donations made to us, 
you give me, I'll send you my the, the prospectus. But any donation, the reference must be as a guy and a name. Yeah. Okay, so we can acknowledge that. Yeah. Great. But I'll send you the prospectus. Yeah. Oh, that'd be great. Are we, are we on email or not? I don't think so. Um, I'll send you my email address. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. Well. well Sorry well, about that. No, no problem. Uh, thanks, Anna. It was great chatting to you. Uh, great looking around your well, thank museum. Thank you for helping us. And let's hope we we can give you a bit of assistance. You know. Every bit. Helps. Every bit helps. So yeah. And legacy viewers, thanks for watching. Uh, until we meet again.